So Jacob, you're going to be playing. Yes. And then we'll uh, we'll talk about the game as we go. But so you said it's we we got we got a few words to to evoke it. It's it's Jules Verne kind of. Jules Verne is like kind of steampunky, but not like super steampunky, right? Like. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I, <laughs> no, I got kind of fine. sidetracked. Will Will over there was distracting us. It's fine. I think the game need audio will. needs to be yeah, louder. Let's turn the game audio. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can't do that until we get in game, so we'll do that. Uh, no, there's a thing here. Yeah, but it's not very good. <laughs> okay. It's okay. We'll we'll, we'll turn it up once we yeah. get in game. Uh, just give give us a little more background about the game because these the ships look very like almost steampunky, but like a very Jules Verne twist on them. I just don't know how to describe that that style very well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really, I don't really know how to describe it, uh, aside from just telling you what the inspirations were, yes. which cool. was, uh, well, one second. <laughs> Let's get the audio levels up here. Cool. Okay. Oh, I like this music already. So, um, like very early on, when I was looking for inspirations for the style of this, um, a couple things came up, like the Disney's Atlantis, do you remember that? Yeah. Like the animated movie had some really cool kind of, uh, it wasn't really steampunk, it was like similar to it. And then there's the, the actual, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea movie from the 50s had like mm. a really awesome sub design. Uh, I don't know, just in general, just. Actually, now that you say Atlantis, like the, the Disney movie, it, it that makes a lot of sense. It, yeah. it feels kind of like that. I mean, we looked at um, subs, like the actual, like what modern subs are, the nuclear military subs, like mm. super streamlined. And um, some of the like finer details are inspired by that. Like the you'll notice the ballast lines on every sub, but it's we kind of went more for fantasy because obviously this thing wouldn't be aqua dynamic. I think one of the conversations we had that we didn't really want a game entirely with floating dicks everywhere. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, it's just... funny because a, a game made explicitly about. Dicks just came out recently, so... <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about genital dressing? I am, yes. Yeah. What yeah. else? <laughs> so there was a question uh, already in the chat about whether this was a, a set world or randomly generated, and I guess, can you just talk about... It's it's essentially a roguelike. Uh, well, no. no. I oh, it's not? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I heard it described similar to FTL, so I, I assumed. Yeah, they, um... So the, the part of it similar to FTL is, like, we can see here inside our ship. Oh, gotcha, um, gotcha. And you can actually control, like, we only have one crew member right now, but mm -hmm. when you get more, you can, like, control where they go, and that affects uh, different aspects of your ship. Gotcha. As far as the um, the overarching kind of story, it's, I mean, it's a campaign. Cool. So the world is made up of these three zones, and those are, those are set. Um, we populate those. But then there's like salvages and enemies and traitors, which are um, procedurally placed into these. But the the campaign and the plot and the characters we can place; they're not procedural. So, and you've gone into this this bar, this underwater like station bar called the dive bar, which is a brilliant pun. Thank you. <laughs> um, and what what are you doing here now? Uh, so this is. Just the first sort of plot point. Okay. Uh, we wanted to introduce some of the characters and also just introduce the concept of like hiring uh, sailors. Gotcha. And uh, it's the first station that you get to, so it has kind of all the basics of like you can loot stuff, you can talk oh. to people, and you can hire. The music is. It, it's very like jaunty sailing and I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're huge fans too, like the... Yeah, our music guy is amazing. Yeah. He's absolutely, he's probably the biggest fan of the game so far. So this, this contrast is something I talked about earlier before we started streaming uh, that I want to bring up again. Uh, the game is 3D and it's 
very like beautifully 3D underwater, but then when you go into the ship or when you go into a station, it takes on this hand-drawn 2D style. Um, right. rather than having like 3D people walking around a bar or anything like that. Uh, why did you guys go that direction? So, if you remember earlier when we were talking about constraints, uh huh. Um, we only had the resources to do a 2D interior. We didn't, like to do a 3D interior with, with um, 3D characters walking around would have taken much more um, effort. Mm -hmm. You'd have to rig and animate all those. So we just kind of made the choice early on. We were like, look, this is what we can do. Um, we want it to integrate like as much as we can get it to. Um, but also, I kind of like how it sort of makes it stand out as... Uh, it forced us to do some things with the camera that ended up being really cool. Like when you transition to um, viewing something 2D, that's a bad example. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you transition to something uh, inside, the camera actually flattens out all the 3D stuff. So it turns mm. into a orthographic camera to help merge the two styles. Um, that's something we've gotten a lot of comments on. Uh, people either like it or they don't. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah. I Was it hard to make the two different styles feel, like, cohesive? Uh, I wouldn't say... It took a lot of effort. Mm. Like, um, if you... Like, if we go back into um, the sub, you can actually see the... Can you go into the... Yeah. Um, so all the borders of the cutaway and stuff, like, had to be sort of hand-painted to make it look like it's actually cutting away from the model. Mm. Um, so it was a bit kind of labor-intensive, but... Um, it wasn't hard, like, we got stuck and we didn't know what to do with it. It was kind of just, like, it took a lot of work. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But it was always kind of like, once we one thing fell into place, then we understood what the next step would be to make it work, kind of. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about the, uh, I, I kind of hate this term, but I guess it is the appropriate one, of mm -hmm. the gameplay loop, right? Like, mm -hmm. are you going to hubs, getting missions, going out, completing them, then coming mm -hmm. back? Are you going linearly kind of deeper and deeper? So, uh, yeah, it's a more of a linear um, campaign style. So the main kind of loop is that, like, when you go to a town, you fill up your air, and you usually will buy resources like uh, scrap metal, food, and stuff that you need when you're going out. Um, so when you go out, um, there's usually quite a bit of dangers because like, the world is populated with uh, different subs or creatures that you can run into. Um, uh -huh. So the main loop would be like, you go out, salvage what you need, uh, maybe pick up some crew members, come back, sell off your salvage, um, and then you know, buy upgrades or hire new crew members. Why are there people in cages at this <laughs> station? This is a jail. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. I guess that would make sense. So these are uh, bounty hunters. So they've captured some other people that have bounties on their heads. So we just ran up with one of them. And now they're fighting, now they're shooting at you. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this crew member that we just hired is a gunner. So that lets us use the guns on the ship. Um, and by hired, you mean ran away from a jail with? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's convenient that you would steal somebody who can shoot back when you are stealing them from a jail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's almost like the game was designed that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I got just a blind spot now. So the combat is, it's almost like really slow, do like aerial dogfighting. What was, what were kind of the, the, the goals or the inspirations with that? So, um, the combat gets more into torpedo play. 
but because that's more complicated, we wanted to introduce like a really basic form of combat first. Oh, you you mean early in the game? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This Where is we are. this is like in the beginning. Right, right. So, in the world's lore, like torpedoes are very expensive. Like the building them, there's no factories anymore. Everything that you see is kind of hand welded, hand put together. Like there's no factories, microprocessors. It's just the technology is limited to what people can do with their hands, and so torpedoes are a rarity or they're very expensive to use. Mm -hmm. And so the secondary weapon that people are relying on is these kind of heated harpoons, they call called bolts. And so they have various kinds of these uh, bolts that they just kind of like manufacture on the sub, they just press them and then fire them out a tube. Mm -hmm. And so the main, the advantage is that it's cheap and the disadvantage is that everybody has them and when you get close to somebody else they will also hit you with it. And so later on when you get torpedoes, it is favorable to try and shoot down their torpedoes with your bolts while trying to hit them with your torpedoes. Yeah, uh, it's funny because somebody pointed this out on the trailer. Um, one of the inspirations for the layout of this was Shadow of the Colossus. Mm. You know how when you're on the horse, it veers off to one side. Um, and it kind of gives this nice cinematic look to it. But in our case, it allows you to see what you're shooting at. So it has like an extra kind of um, functional purpose. But the combat, um, like the kind of simplicity that we're going for is kind of inspired by like the Warthog in Halo. Because um, that was like, back in like 2001 when I played that, it was like the first vehicle that I felt was intuitive in a game. Because hmm. it was just like, okay, point to go, and it goes. <laughs> like, it was, there wasn't much more to it, so we wanted the sub to feel um, like you could just pick it up and play. <laughs> what is that alarm that's going off right now? Uh, he's below his crush depth right now. Ah. Which basically means that at any point, the hole could collapse. Um... And that, that is some, like, classic submarine moment right there. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. going too deep, sirens blaring, red lights <laughs> flashing, that's... Yeah, it's uh, generally not good for your crew if your hole collapses. <laughs> <laughs> they don't appreciate it. Somebody asked in, in the chat if you could salvage ships that you destroy or anything like that? Yeah, you can um, dock with... So... If you shoot a ship just enough to cripple it without fully destroying it, you can dock with it and uh, loot what they have inside. Sometimes there'll be crew members in there that you can bring onto your own crew. Mm. <laughs> Is that the uh, little quest complete sound effect? Yeah. yeah. It's so encouraging. It was so peppy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you did it. So I just we just saw a pop up that, that said feeding your crew. So there's like, what type of, of resource stuff is there? there? There's food you gotta get, ammo, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So if you check out the lower left, that has our resources on it. Mm. Um, inside our sub, there's like these different stations. Um, go. Yeah. Go inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no so, one likes a backseat submarine driver now. Yeah, I'm a backseat gamer. Like, no matter what. Uh, so the stations can each hold different crew members, right? So if we go to the gun station, um, you can actually see when you add crew member, it changes your stats. Mm. Um, but if you run out of food, then all of your stats go bye-bye. So uh, it's not like you'll, your people won't die, but they just won't work for you. Mm. Um, whereas if you run out of air, it's everyone dies. It's game over. Mm. Uh, one of our longtime subs, Chris86, asks, have the devs been inspired by other sub-games like Subculture or Archimedean Dynasty? I've heard about Subculture, but Archimedean Dynasty is new to me. So, yeah, I haven't no, played I, either of those, but yeah. I've been here, like, uh -huh. ever since we started releasing trailers for this, people have been like, oh yeah, it's like Subculture, and I'm like, I yeah. need to really check this out. <laughs> <laughs> like... We have checked it out since, but uh, no, I don't. I wouldn't say they're inspired. We started actually when we started pitching this game. We started getting excited about it. We we're just talking about how much we liked Freelancer or like some of those space games mm -hmm. that were coming out, like Elite Dangerous, 
Uh, but we also realized that Elite Dangerous is just a much higher production value, so we couldn't really compete. And then we started talking about, well, what's kind of like a space game? It's like submarines are kind of like a space game. And then that kind of took that conversation in that direction and pushed us in that this, kind of direction. This music is getting really excited right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is the uh, sort of main adventure game. <laughs> yeah. Um, this moment was really important to us. It's like one that we put up a lot more time into. Um, just because like it's the first time when you go from this narrow crevice to this like, wide open. Mm. Oh yeah, it's like much. It's much opener now. You, I, I kind of expected the game to be more enclosed, but this is like open sea oh, yeah. sailing. Most of the game is like this. Um, the beginning section is enclosed so that we can kind of guide it. Right. As game intros do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of inspirations, uh, one that um, I'm sure some people out there know is uh, Skies of Arcadia, which was like a... Oh my god. I'm sorry, I just got really excited. Skies, <laughs> oh, yeah. Skies of Arcadia <laughs> Legends on GameCube, yes. the GameCube yeah, port, yeah. was like one of my favorite games ever ever when I was a kid. It was the first game that I, like, ever played for longer than, like, an eight-hour stretch for a game. Yeah, same here. It's, uh... All you, all you gotta do to sell me on a game is say it's like Skies of Arcadia, and I'm like, done, where's my wallet? I, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, that was... That was one of the inspirations as far as tone, because it has this, like, really adventurous kind of fantasy tone to it, but it's also deals with some, like, serious themes. Mm -hmm. um, and they took the story seriously, uh, which I really liked. Were, I'm not going to get into the story because they're spoilers. Yeah, that's fine. But um, a lot of the ship designs sure. were also inspired by oh, I think you're the Skies of Arcadia ships. So those are torpedoes now. Yeah. Uh, so a pirate just wandered into the town, and uh, the guild protector took him out. So similar, you mentioned Elite, similar to Elite, the the stations kind of have protectors, yeah. essentially. You can't just go and, like, attack them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you can attack the protectors, but it usually doesn't end well. Right. <laughs> oh. I love that people don't actually talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ha-ha! It kind of reminds yeah. me of, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Sid Meier's Pirates? Do you ever play that one? I played that, yeah. Sid Meier's Pirates, when you cross another ship in the ocean, uh -huh. they'll just, like, yell things at each other. They'll just be like, hey up from, like, one <laughs> ship to the other. Yeah, like, yeah, we wanted some kind of click, like, reaction mm -hmm. click people. Uh, we had to cut a lot of dialogue, so like some of the stuff is missing here, but they still have. We still talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> we do that way too often at the <laughs> office. It's like ah, ah, ah. So you've got you just went to the station and got a mission that was what 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 have they asked you to do essentially? So that guy was an uh, engineer, and we came to him asking for a sub upgrade. Uh, so he's just like, okay, you need to get these things for us. Mm. Uh, so the each of if you remember from the beginning, there were like three subs that you can start off with. Yeah. Each of those has upgrade levels. Gotcha. Um, and that also lets you dive deeper, uh, which is the main way that you progress. So right now, uh, basically, we need to salvage the parts that we need to upgrade the sub. It's kind of like an introduction to how do you craft the new upgrades to your sub or buying your subs. Uh, we don't do fetch quests very often. I, don't, I think like this is the only one that really is kind of like a bona fide switch, uh, fetch quest, but it kind of just teaches you that this is how you go and get new subs or upgrade your sub. What is this kind of orange, like fishies, like glowing kind of leading a path? So. Whenever you have like a destination, these guys will help to guide you. Oh, okay, so and that's like a that's the quest indicator. Is yeah, yeah. A little line of glowing luminescent fish. Yeah. Early earlier in development, we had like a big arrow, and it just totally took you out of the game. Mm. So yeah. we we're like, ah, oh, let's put it as fish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's still like 
because it is these like big sort of open zones, um, people were kind of getting lost before we had something like that in there. Mm. But we wanted that to be able to guide you without being like way. Yeah, uh, I played a lot of World of Warcraft before, and uh, I didn't like how you would get exact destinations. Uh, and especially later expansions, they started introducing kind of like what used to be mods. They started just adding it to the main game while oh, you ran into the mines. Lucky me. <laughs> I think it was about to start attacking me and took a wrong turn. A pirate just ran into a mine? Yeah, yeah he just ran into some mines. <laughs> uh, so instead of just kind of having the fish everywhere, we just want to put them near what we call landmarks. Uh, so whenever you're near one of these like special locations, the fish will appear and kind of tell you where to go next. Mm. Let's see if we can bring up the map, and then that's like a part of the. I mean, the main kind of goal is that you explore and salvage and find things, so you can upgrade yourself and get better at it. But also, kind of you collect information about the map that you're in. So right now I'm near a landmark. I think yeah. So after you get the map you start seeing like where these landmarks are. So there's the town where I was earlier and then the crab thing was right next to it. And now the latest one I, connect to, uh, I collected was this giant seat. So you don't see where the sub is on the map, but I can infer that I'm right next to the giant seat because that's that's where I am. Wow. Oh. Also, pull up the compass. Yeah. When you get the landmarks, they appear on your compass. Yeah. So the main technique of navigating is that you, you get near a landmark, you see where the fish is headed on the compass, and so even when they disappear, you still know what direction roughly you're supposed to head in. That's really cool. So it's 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 help. It's giving you a little help, but it's not like just holding your hand, no. giving you a quest marker. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I also I like yeah. that you don't show up on the map either. That's kind of one of my favorite parts about games is is exploring maps, and like it feels like that means that adventuring and exploring oh, is like shit. actually a part of this game rather than just yeah. follow the path. Yeah, I mean, exploration is one of the main things of the game, so um, when we first were doing that, like, we were met with some, like, some of the earlier players were like, why aren't you on the map? Mm. Um, so it, it was Jacob's idea, and I wasn't sure of it until pretty near the end where, like, it all came together, and it was like, oh, like, it, yeah. it adds to the feeling of um, kind of being lost and Yeah, exploring. we want people to get lost, but not... Like, some people will get frustrated because they just want to kind of get it over with. Uh, but we wanted to, like, keep making getting lost a little bit more fun. <laughs> like, kind of like in Skyrim, uh, for example, you go walk around and you'll find stuff happening that you didn't expect. Uh, but I noticed, like, after about an hour at Skyrim, I only was pretty much just looking at the top compass the whole time cause the, to find out where to go. And the, that kind of made me miss a lot of the, the sights around me. There was a, a question in the chat earlier about if you guys think that ocean games are, like, coming into style a little bit, especially after Subnautica is still in early access, mm. and then Abzu was released last year to, mm. a, a, you know, a ton of praise. Is there, like, is that, a, like, a, a way that... Yeah, I think it's definitely um, a growing genre. Because mm -hmm. when we began development on this... There was nothing. Yeah, it is. There was very, very few ocean yeah. games. Mm -hmm. um, Subnautica was actually, like, we have to do, <laughs> there's like a thing called a competitive analysis where you're like basically playing other games that are similar to what you're developing. Um, and Subnautica was one of the games that we played. Um, and actually, like, when I was playing Subnautica, it was just to like check it out and see like, okay, how close is this to ours? Is it a direct competitor? Da da da. But then I started having so much fun that I, <laughs> I just like kept playing. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely think it's a style that's coming back in, uh, and I kind of understand why it hasn't been a thing before because it plays a lot like a space game. But uh, the main challenge of an underwater game is that you have to fill in everything. Where space, you can have a lot of vacuum, and you don't mm. have to like physically populate it that much. Uh, so it's a very asset heavy compared to space games. Yeah. So I understand why it hasn't been done that much before, but yeah, I hope to see more underwater games because I really like the setting. Yeah, I, oh, shit, I think you saw me because I pinged earlier. Compared to uh, Subnautica and Abzu, though, this this game is very dark. 
right? Like Subnautica and Abzu are games with like bright blue kind of like almost Galapagos style oceans, uh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and like this is this is like a very I mean it goes along with the the Jules Verne kind of aesthetic, but you guys have chosen to go with much more like a deeper ocean, a, a darker ocean. Mm. Yeah, and when you get down to like a thousand meters and more, it's like pitch black. Hmm. So there's yeah, we definitely like show it because I feel like with submarines like this, um, you know, that's one thing they can do. That, like you can't have in a diver game is like show those really deep, dangerous parts. Uh, there were uh, a couple comments about where are the giant whales and giant like where are the sea creatures besides the little fish. Okay, so. There are sea creatures, um, but part of the lore is this game takes place in a sort of flooded world. Mm. So there was some cataclysm that happens, and whales are gone. There are no whales. <laughs> um. Specifically, the cataclysm was like anti-whale. <laughs> you know, well, whales, dolphins, like the mammals. Okay, got, gotcha, um, gotcha. So if you notice, like any time you look up, it's all ice. Ah, uh, okay. There's no surface. Yeah, you can't surface, so anything that would breathe air yeah. is dead. You can you can leave the story like mysterious and cryptic if you'd like to. Yeah, I mean yeah. the the setting is that the world flooded and then it froze over the top. So something happened a long time ago, longer than anybody alive has ever known anybody who was alive at that point. And so people have just gotten used to it by now and started surviving underwater. But people still dream of a surface and kind of dream of kind of seeing the sun one day. But it's uh, yeah, it's kind of it is a gloomy setting for sure. Mm -hmm. There's another person said that you guys need Cthulhu in here. <laughs> of course. So yeah. I love Lovecraft, but Do you yeah, have any saves in the abyss? I do have saves in the abyss. Oh, yeah. We should we, can we should dive into that. We should dive yeah. into it. <laughs> yeah, we, can, we can show that a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, if you guys want to switch over and show a, a different part of the game. Yeah, I think I will. Yeah, because this is the, the early kind of shallow part of the game. Oh, even the like little, the, is it the save or the heal yeah, effect? Is little green fish? fish yeah. yeah, yeah. That's cute. Um, while we're, uh, James, James gets your joke. No, not that one. No, it's not the one. It's further down. No. While we're loading into that, we can also um, open it up to Twitch chat questions. So if you have any questions for us or the Arachnid guys about, you know, either Deluvian or anything, um, please tag us with at PC Gamer in the Twitch chat and send us your questions. We are going to keep playing to show off a little bit more, but we'll take your questions while we do that because there's no reason not to. It's a, it's a lovely yeah. time. Uh, cool. If you are a subscriber, we will try to get to your questions I think first. This one is good. <laughs> no, no, not Farter McGee. That's, no. <laughs> but, uh, you can do light. Uh, up, up, oh, up. light. I didn't see it. Light. Uh, if you're a subscriber on our Twitch channel, we're trying to get to your questions first. Also, uh, if you were part of the Discord, discord.gg slash PCGamer, you will know that we have two new emotes already. So if you use either PCG James with a capital J, you'll get okay. Mr. James Davenport's face. And if you do PCG Steven's dad with Steven and dad capitalized, you'll get... A lovely, quickly made emote of Steven face palming when his dad walked into the room during the stream last week. <laughs> um, it's one of my new favorite emotes on Twitch, uh, and and I encourage you to use that one. Uh, also, thank you, Thomas Owens, for just uh, re for subscribing. Um, so Steven with a V, by the way. So, where are we now? The Speaking abyss, of, you said. Yeah. So this is. The Abyss, which is like a very deep zone of the game. Um, it's much darker, and there's creatures down here, so... Um, and we're in a much higher level sub right now, so you can actually take the depth. Oh yeah, it's super different with like the kind of the drill thingies, the spinnies. Yeah. Oh shit. Uh... I think this is Duck's Peak, asks, or Duck's Peak, one of the two, asks, better with a controller or a keyboard? You're playing with a controller right now, yeah. but does the game function with a mouse and keyboard as well? Yeah, I think it's better with a controller. I think Jacob thinks it's better with 
keyboard and mouse. Yeah, he's mainly console, and I represent PC Gamer in the office. So. <laughs> yeah, so it, it depends on what you're used to, but okay. it works with both. It doesn't, just from watching it, it doesn't necessarily seem like the type of game that would, like... Like, there are some games, like, if you look at, you know, Super Meat Boy and, and any twin-stick shooter, it's like, yeah, that would make more sense with a, a controller, but this one looks like it would be fine with a mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Um, this is, the darkness makes this much, much more tense, the fights. Yeah, yeah and the... It forces you to use your sonar more often. Hmm. Uh, just... Yeah, note about the sonar is that it makes you see things around you easier, but you also, anything that gets hit by sonar also notices you. They can hear where the ping is coming from. Gotcha. And so especially other ships will, if they're hostile, then they'll start targeting you even from further away than they would otherwise. Yeah. And especially when you get down into these trenches, it's like you need it to navigate. Uh, James, just like 20 feet that way, sitting in the office, asks, yeah. <laughs> um, have you guys played uh, Sunless Seas Submariner expansion? And then also, no. just another person asked, have you, like, how similar is this to Sunless Sea? Or were you, were you guys inspired by that game at all? Uh, I played that while developing this Sunless Sea. I love Sunless Sea. Uh, I think, like, some of the, the darkness and the story elements were a little bit informed by it, but uh, gameplay-wise, like, the kind of roguelike way that some of the sea operates is not really in this game, no. Uh, but definitely, like, a little bit of that weird science fiction Jules Verne story of the time things. Is, uh... Wait, they have a Submariner expansion? I guess, yeah, I haven't, I haven't played that. It's so. called Submariner with a Z. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, is, that is the one expansion to the game, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I haven't... I haven't played the original Sun this scene. Cool. Yeah, so you might, um... Oh, we're speaking of, like, larger creatures here. Uh, below us is, like, a massive, uh, ribcage. Oh, man. Like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Send out a ping for that. That ping effect. I wish the podcast listeners could, could see that, because it's real, real nice. The way it kind of like just yeah. stretches over the environment. Yeah, that was. That a, is a huge rib cage. Yes. Yes. It's very big. <laughs> uh, there was another question from Chris eighty six asks: Would the devs consider doing another Kickstarter, or are you done with that platform? So this game was hmm. kickstarted a while ago. Yep. Um, so was it a positive experience for you? Would you do it again? Uh, it was positive in the sense that like we found a lot of support through Kickstarter, like, um, it was just awesome to have people, like, interested in the project and, like, talking about it. Um, the, I think if, if we did it again, we would need more of, like, a dedicated person. Hmm. Um, to operate to run it, yeah. Yeah, because it, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Like, it's a lot of work that you don't really think about, like, um, you know, for delivery, I think we didn't have like an excessive amount. We had like sixteen hundred backers, but it's still like a lot to keep track of. Um, Is that thing shooting lasers at you? Uh, it's kind of like neon snot. Okay. This is a this is a creature. Oh yeah, it's yeah. not a ship. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's like an organic ammunition. Uh, yeah, I mean, to answer the question, though, I would consider doing another Kickstarter if if the uh, Kickstarter market the down. is still, like, supportive of any projects. Yeah. It's hard to say that, like, the Kickstarter thing changes so quickly. Yeah, it's like, uh, some of it's in, send this out, and I'm kind of like, it kind of depends on, like, some of the really big projects, if they deliver. I think it's going to define the future of that platform. And this is a lot more, um, uh, like, physical goods now on, on Kickstarter recently. Mm. Like it's a lot of, like, little gadgets and tidbits and, like, the little flicker thing. Yeah. yeah. This is, uh, here's another question come at you guys. Thomas Owens, our, one of our new subscribers, asks, some news, out some news outlets are saying the game is Dark Souls-inspired. Could you elaborate on that? 
And real quickly, before before you guys answer, I feel like Dark Souls inspired is like one of the most overused yeah. like <laughs> gaming comparisons nowadays. Okay, so um, I think that's I think that came from PAX. Yeah, uh, we were at sure PAX, PAX and yeah. we were talking. I don't remember specifically. We were we were talking to press about it. And uh, it was like an interview, and they were like, oh, like, what are some of the games you guys are playing? And um, Jacob <laughs> loves Dark Souls, Yeah. right? Um, uh-huh. And the, the part of that that we like, or that I think kind of bled into the game is the... There are some parts where it's just unforgiving difficulty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I've been reading the comments online, I think that part is getting like blown out of proportion because it just came up from like, oh yeah, we like that game. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. Like the game does have kind of a pretty harsh difficulty. Like it, it looks easy now because I'm controlling it, but uh, just getting used to the controls. It looks uh, easy now because I designed it. Yeah, exactly. Like, but we uh, feedback from testers is like it takes a little while for them to get used to the controls, and it's kind of like one of the major. Uh, that's one of the major humps you gotta get over just to smoothly control it. Gotcha. <laughs> Chris says a Dark Souls inspired roguelike oh, with CCG elements. Is <laughs> just as many buzzwords as you can put in there. MMO. Um, yeah. You know. Oh, that was a lot of, yeah, lot yeah. of little guys attacking you. Yeah, I, I, I angered at best. <laughs> yeah, these guys are bad news when there's a nest of them. Yeah, sometimes, like, as... Because, like, we, we developed this from, like, a basement office, right? And, you know, there's a lot of, like, uh, conversations happening online. We might not even be aware of it. That we, we saw, like, on the trailer, like, all these people commenting about, like, Dark Souls inspired? Like, what does that even mean? We're just like, dude. Like, wait. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, we don't even come up with this stuff. It's just, like, you know, there's so much information from different interviews. Well, on, on as part of that, going off of that, Varendil asked, um, when operating on your kinds of constraints, how difficult is it to manage your own ideas? Uh, were there many times when you had a great idea but just couldn't do it, essentially? Yes. Yes? yes. Many, many times. Uh, we actually, um, earlier on in development, we worked with a producer who's uh, very experienced uh, in AAA. And basically, uh, he has that skill set of a producer who's like really good at saying, okay, you can only do this much. Um, and we came in with like 50 ideas. And he, <laughs> he just like sat down with us. He was like, all right, I'm going to make you guys get rid of 40 of these ideas. <laughs> or, like, you know, whatever chunk. Um, he was like, look you need to get this done in a certain amount of time, so, like, take your top favorite ideas and drop everything else. <laughs> um, and that's, like, it's it's good to do. It's good to have that kind of sobering moment because otherwise you just won't finish the game or you're spread too thin and you can't, like, get everything to the quality that you want. But I imagine it stings a little bit, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, especially, like, if you've already put work into an idea or like a couple ideas and then you just gotta be like, all right, we're scrapping it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's just part of the part of the process. Uh, JBJ Blaze, I think our longest subscriber asks, uh, this is, this is, this question might come off the wrong way. It came off the wrong way when I first read it, but don't, don't take it this way, I don't mm -hmm. think. Could Diluvian be the deep water no man's sky, but cheaper and better on launch? <laughs> oh, I'm so offended. <laughs> no, uh, it's it's just you gotta be careful when comparing comparing to, to that game because people have strong opinions one way or the other. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I see what he means in terms of like it's got a similar once again loop of yeah. like go out, explore, collect, improve go further, but obviously the biggest difference that I see is that No Man's Sky is completely procedurally generated and just kind of, like, go wherever. Right. Yeah, I, 
To be honest, I haven't played No Man's Sky. Mm. Um, That's okay. Based on, <laughs> uh, based on what I know about it, yeah, I mean that that's a big difference that you mentioned. It's it's entirely procedural, whereas um, Diluvian, like we hand model the maps and um, a lot of the locations. Mm. But the biggest kind of difference, I think, would just be that we have like a full campaign. Mm -hmm. like, there's a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, there's a lot of characters you meet along the way. Um, so it's not just like a. I mean. <laughs> It's, like, there's always, like, a, a next quest to do. Right. It's interesting to, to see you jump ahead so far uh, and see how the combat has really changed, too. Mm -hmm. Like, this ship, correct me if I'm wrong, but seems very nimble. It yes. seems much more maneuverable than the, like, slightly bigger one you had before. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, that a lot of that has to do with, um, there are three classes of ships, and the one he had before was a salvaging class. Whereas this one is a uh, sort of exploration class, so they're faster and more maneuverable. But they don't have as good of like weapons or um, inventory. Uh, Chris actually asks again, how does the save system work? Is it auto-saves? It, it looked like it saved every time you went to a, a port, basically, or a, a yeah, base? Yeah, pretty much. We have checkpoints set around, uh, generally always near a town, like a place you can dock. Uh, mostly because if you... If you save somewhere and you're low on air, uh, you could get a save file where you just can kind of blow yourself up every single time you load it. Mm -hmm. So you're always, all the save points will be near somewhere where you can refill air. It's kind of like the general rule of thumb. And you mentioned that there were those, the torpedoes and the, the bolts. Yeah. Um, are there other types of weapons you can get? Yeah, so... You can um, leave some stuff mysterious if it's like late game stuff. Uh, well, I won't mention late game stuff, uh, but the way torpedoes and bolts work is like if you were to compare it to an FPS, it's like your gun and your grenade. Okay. Uh, so there's multiple bolt cannons that you can get and multiple uh, torpedoes. Yeah, so different types of grenades and different types of bullet shooting things. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so at any given time, you have one uh, bolt cannon and one torpedo equipped. So this is uh, Jacob's home base. Uh, it's basically like throughout the game you can upgrade this thing and then like it adds more oh. annexes and like actually some of the characters in here are Kickstarter yeah, backers. Yeah. The high rollers from the Kickstarter wanted designs. <laughs> so like this guy. Waddles. Waddles. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to Waddles. If you're watching. Captain Nemo. I think that one's actually from my dad. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. O, he's got the oxygen. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. So, can you build up this base? Can you expand it? Yeah. Cool. So, we think it's upgraded once? I think yeah, you have the trade annex. Yeah, yeah. so you, you build one of them and then come and get the next one in. And then the last question we'll take is, uh, Interfuser asked, any talk about multiplayer at all? Is there any sort of... No, there's no multiplayer. Cool. <laughs> it's, yeah. the, it's a single player experience. I've, yeah. I've said this on the show before, but every time I've talked to indie developers, they've said that if you want to add online multiplayer to your game, you need to expect to like take whatever your development time is and then just double it. And that's pretty much how long it takes to add multiplayer. Yeah. That's a generous... Uh, <laughs> and that might be not enough. That might be too generous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's... Double if you have people that have worked on online games before. Yeah. Also, oh, wow, like, yeah. Double your time and double your budget. Uh huh. Uh, anything less, and you're selling yourself short. Like, well, it's, it's I, I'm excited to, to play the single player of this. Um, I think we are just about out of time, though. Cool. Uh, thank you very, very much, guys, for, for coming on the show. Um, it, it was an absolute pleasure. The game looks really, really good. Once again, Anybody curious, Diluvian, spelled D-I-L-U-V-I-O-N, will be out February 2nd next month. Um, not early access or anything, right? Just full release? Full release. Full release. And, uh, and pre-orders are available now, actually, on Steam and uh, GOG. GOG, yeah. And uh, how, how much is the game going to be? So it's 20 bucks. Uh, if you pre-order, I think you get... 15% off, I think it is now. Yeah. So it's like... 
running by. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I didn't go to school for math. <laughs> no, it's uh, I think it's like sixteen bucks, uh, something like that. Either. Don't quote me on that, but <laughs> go to the internet and look. Um, uh, yeah, you can find it just by Googling Diluvian or Diluvian Steam or any of that. Um, is there anybody or anywhere you want to direct people besides the Steam page, website, or anything like that? Oh, Diluvian.com, Facebook page. Google it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. The best way. Uh, yeah, if you have something to tell us, yell at us at the Steam forums, the community forums. Uh, that's probably what we're going to be checking the most. Yeah, we also have a, a Twitter at arachnid underscore games. Um, so there's a lot of ways to yell at us. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on. It was it was a pleasure. And uh, thank you very much to everyone out ho at home who was uh, watching or lit... Watching? Oh, my watching. God. It's, I'm sorry. We <laughs> got to just, just cut M. it Night Shyamalan. <laughs> Uh, anybody who's watching or listening at home, thank you very, very much. We always thank appreciate you. it. Any new subs, uh, be sure to join us in Discord, and we will see you next week at the same place, twitch.tv slash PCGamer, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific time. We'll see you then. Thanks very much again, guys. Thank you Thanks for having so. us.